A group of the people of the book would love to lead you astray. This is referring to an incident that happened where some of the Jews said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal and Ammar ibn Yasir, Why have you left your religion? You're following the religion of Muhammad, not the true religion. And so this ayah was sent. Now some of these people gathered together and said, What shall we say regarding this matter? How shall we lead them astray? And the group that was hoping to lead them astray, as we mentioned, were the Jews, but also including the Christians. Because the Jews and Christians have gone from knowing the truth to falsehood. And certain destruction shall come their way. Is it the case when we shall be destroyed in the earth? Surah Sajda, Ayah 10. The same wording for the word dalal can mean destruction. And they're not aware of this. Meaning, they're not aware that Allah has informed the believers of what the unbelievers are saying about them. And they're also not aware that they lead no one astray but themselves. People of the book, why do you disbelieve in the signs of Allah? Qatada ibn Da'ima says, meaning Muhammad and Islam. And when it says, and you bear witness, meaning that Muhammad shall be sent in your book. But then you disbelieved in him. Close quote. So this statement that we have, this statement that we have, that... The people bear witness to that which has been brought. But then they turn and disbelieve in it. Is a reference to when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Remember, go back all 1,434 years. Go all the way back. He arrives in Medina. A delegation of rabbis comes to see him. They ask him four questions. A delegation of Christians comes from Najran. It's not like they didn't know him. If they didn't know who he was, if they didn't know what he was about, it would have been no loss, it would have been no harm for them not to know who he was. But because they knew who he was, because they knew what he represented, because they actually took the time out of their schedule to actually come and see him is proof positive they knew what he represented. And so when they came to see him, and then they rejected him, that was the reason for their folly. And we see that today with the Jews and the Christians and the condition that they're in. This is why when we have Surah Al-Fatiha, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember Surah Al-Fatiha was revealed in Mecca. It was revealed in Mecca first. But he said that Sirat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim. Now this ayah, Sirat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim, the path of those who you have favored. Ghayyari al-Maghdubi alayhim. And he said, Who are these? And the companion said, Who are those who have Allah's wrath? He said, They are the Jews. This is in Mecca. This is before any incident. This is a prefigurement that they're going to reject faith. Even though they hadn't met yet, there was a prefigurement, a shadow, a type, a, a archetype that they're going to reject faith. And those who are astray, the Christians. The Christians. This is in Mecca before he even got into a discussion with them from their delegations. So when you understand this, when you understand this, you need to realize the fact that the Jews and Christians are not Abrahamic brothers. They've rejected faith. And so because of that, you have an obligation to bring the faith to them. You're not the third faith in line, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. You're the only faith in line. Because 
profit killing has been the case of the children of Israel and those who call themselves Christians who are merely a subset of the children of Israel. How many prophets have Muslims killed? They haven't killed any prophets. But the Jews have killed plenty. And that's not saying anything against them racially. It's saying something against their religion. So in closing all of this off, today we've completed up until the principles regarding Isa alayhi salam. Next week, inshallah, if Allah preserves our lives, we now start to talk about where Allah differentiates the difference between Jews, Christians, and Muslims in behavior in their character, in their attitude, because there are differences. There are differences, major differences. That's why I mentioned St. Paul's Cathedral. With all of the corruption and all the wickedness that's going on, you would have thought that one of those people, one of those priests would have torn his frock and said, I'm with the people. They have to be fed, the poor have to be fed, the illiterate have to be taught, I'm with the homeless people. He did no such thing. Because like I told you, he's probably got a Prius on finance and he's got, he's got also a mortgage and he has his pension to worry about. And his pension comes from where? The church. And the church derives his power from where? The government. Because the government's done what? Made it a state religion. That's why. He can't speak the truth. Even if he wanted to. Rowan Williams tried to hint at the truth. Rowan Williams tried to hint at the truth. And almost lost his job. That's why he's been quiet lately. Last thing we heard of him of any public trial was he was at a Druid festival celebrating their deities. He can't say anything about Christ being king or anything. Because what's king is the pound sterling. He can't mention Christ as the king. He's not on any of the money. So this is why, this is why I say to you, it's important to understand that all of this was happened. From next week on, you'll be starting to talk about the issues that surround Jews and Christians as a people and Muslims as a people and what's expected of them and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions their behaviors. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم استغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم الحمد الرحيمين. Is there any question over what we've covered today? Yes. Um, Okay. Question is, is there any significance that the prophets, uh, they were shepherds, all of them were shepherds, as in the Hadith and the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, that all the prophets were shepherds, uh, and, the, and the situation that the Hawari Yun, they were fishermen or tailors. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam rasulillah. There are wisdoms that you could take from that because both jobs are jobs that require patience. Fishing and tailoring and shepherding require patience. They require a good character because if you have a harsh character or you're impatient, you cannot shepherd sheep because they will run from you, they will flee from you. And if you have a harsh character, you're not patient, you cannot complete sewing on clothes. Stitching is a very tedious, long job. People that sew for a living or have sewn clothes know it's a very tedious and long job. But you have to have patience to do it. And fishing is a long job. Sometimes you catch nothing waiting all day. And sometimes in a few hours, you're catching and catching and catching and you don't know what happened. And you go home early. Right? It all comes from patience and being, and also those jobs have to do with trust in Allah because you don't always have a customer every day. No one comes and buys a sheep every day. Sometimes you go months and months and months and no one buys a single sheep. No one buys a single scrap of clothing. No one buys any fish. And then one day you can't sell them fast enough. You sell out of them. It's trust on Allah and patience. Second question. Um, when Sayyidina Isa was lifted onto the heavens, was Question is, is when the Prophet Isa when he um, ascended, was his mother Mayyam as Sadiq alayhi salam was she aware <clears throat> was she aware that this was going to happen? Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. I do not have the answer to that question. That would require research because that requires going into the history and all these other things and I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. And the third question? No third question? Okay, yes. What's, what's the Muslim position regarding what's known as the last of our instant? Okay. The question is what it, what should Muslims understand regarding the Last Supper? Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa rasulillah. 
We as Muslims have no problem with that, but the difference is, is how Protestants view the Last Supper, where it shows there's men gathered around and they're standing at a table and some are posing and some are hugging and all these other things. This is, this is the Protestant position. If you actually look at the Orthodox churches, the Orthodox churches agree with the Muslims on a table, a spread table coming down from the sky, especially the Byzantium and Coptics. They believe that. So if you're talking about the original, before uh, Protestantism came, we are by and large in agreement about the events. The issue is not the content. Again, it's not content, it's the significance. So the Orthodox Christians will say, well, this is proof. This was proof of his deity because he predicted his own death and so on and so forth. The Muslims would say, no, there was no such prediction of his death. And it's a proof of his prophecy because prophets have knowledge of the unseen that Allah has given them. So our issue is not a dispute of content. It's a dispute of continuity. So when a Protestant tells you, do you, do you what do you Muslims say about the Last Supper? It's, well, we certainly don't understand the same thing that Protestants would understand. Our understanding would be much closer to the Orthodox churches of the East. Because they have, as I said, especially the Arab Christians, there's, there's more intact with them. A man is coming to you, a Protestant is coming to you with a book in English, trying to preach to you about men that lived thousands of years ago who spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, using a Greek translation that was, that's gone into Latin, that has then been translated into English, and he's going to teach you the word. So you have to be careful and look at things carefully. Is there another question? Yes? Regarding the Last Supper, mm -hmm. uh, obviously the Christians just realize this in that there's women in that picture called Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And could you just, uh, in the Islamic world, you know, just elaborate on what a Mary Magdalene was? The question is regarding the Last Supper, some mm -hmm. state that. Mary, uh, some of the Christians state that Mary Magdalene was present at the Last Supper. Some uh, revisionist historians have said that. What should be our position on this? Alhamdulillah. We really don't have such a position because that painting is by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Islam uh, predates uh, the painting as well as the other things. Now, if you're talking about Mary Magdalene as, as a person, as a historical personage, According to Christian his, historians, that she was a prostitute that converted to uh, the faith of the Prophet Isa alayhi salam and uh, changed her ways dramatically. Uh, as far as ourselves, I have not researched into that uh, issue enough to know the, um, to actually look into it independently, to verify it independently. I don't know. Our position would be to basically affirm all those who believed in the Prophet Isa and the disciples. So we use a general principle. It's just like if someone comes to you and says, well, do you believe such and such was a prophet or such and such was a prophet and they weren't specifically mentioned in the book of the Sunnah? Our reply is we believe in all the prophets because we don't know before or after. We just say we believe in all the prophets because we can't go any further. Just like we say we believe in all the disciples of all the prophets. We don't know all their names. I don't know about that. So I, I affirm all of them though. That's the most I can say. Is there a final question? Final question. Yes. You know the Jews when they do when they crucify somebody, um, is it because they want to put a curse on them, and uh, is that one of the reasons why they were trying to, um, you know, put away the thought that Isa was a prophet? Okay. The question is, when Jews crucify someone, why do they crucify someone? And number two, uh, what is the reasoning why they were trying to do so? to negate the prophet of the prophet Isa alayhi When you look at crucifixion as practiced by the children of Israel, one of the reasons it was practiced was for false prophets. If someone was a false prophet, then they would uh, use crucifixion as a means against them. Sometimes crucifixion was used as a death penalty for people who claimed deity or people who claimed to be prophets or people who were robbers or people who were rapists. Crucifixion would be used as a punishment to warn other people off from these crimes. Muslims have used crucifixion in the past. We know the case of Mansur al-Hallaj. His death warrant was signed by Imam al-Junaid al-Baghdadi, sahib al-Tariqain, uh, because of him, him claiming, claiming deity or stating deity. So he was crucified. So because of this, Muslims have practiced it Christians have practiced it, Jews have practiced it. Like I said, it's for false prophets, people who claim deity, 
or robbers, rapists, criminals, people who've done egregious crimes so severe that they're removed from society. The practice of crucifixion is sometimes used with bounding the hands, but more often than not, many people have only been made f familiar with the practice of driving large nails through the middle of the wrist, which forces the hands into an open palm, and driving them through the feet. Now there's two bones in between the wrist joint where the, it can support the weight of the body. And the same thing is with the ankles and the feet. Now when you hang someone up there on a cross and you have a sedile, which is what, where they can set their buttocks on, they have to lift themselves up to try to breathe and to keep from suffocating and choking on their own fluid in their lungs. And often that can take a week or more for someone to die. And it's an excruciating pain because you're basically suffocating and drowning in your own lung fluid. Sometimes out of mercy, one of the guards would come and say, well, he keeps lifting himself up and going down and lifting himself up and sinking down. Let me just break his legs. So he suffocates quickly and then that'll be the end of him. So he comes and he just breaks his legs and he suffocates and he, and he sags down. That's what cruci crucifixion is not designed uh, to make you want to buy a cookbook. It's designed to drive a point home, just like stoning to death and other death penalty punishments is designed to drive a point home. So when they're trying to kill the Prophet Isa, they're trying to make a point because they're thinking, well, if we succeed in doing this, as we saw it in half the Prophet Shia, or killing other prophets, then there will be a way of disproving that he's a prophet. What is the reason why Christians are aware of them? Because hmm. they're aware of this. Yes, the reason why the Christians wear the cross, they are aware of it. But what a Christian will say is, this is a symbol of freedom for me. Because when he poured out his blood on the cross at Calvary, that was a remission of sins for everyone. You, me, everyone. So I wear this as a sign that that's been done. In, to, which, to which one of my colleagues once said to them, we were in the West Coast, and he said, well then, a friend of mine that protected me, pointing to me when people were shooting at us, should I not wear a necklace of a golden nine millimeter? Because that was the implement that he protected me from to keep me from being killed. And he said, no, 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 you're mixing things up. It's nothing to do with that. But it is. The implement of punishment or torture or pain that was used, they say that it's a symbol of freedom. For the Muslim, it's clear that it's a symbol of idolatry. It's false. It's a false god and we have to avoid it. والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وشهد ولا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك إنه غفور رحيم والسلام عليكم